Hey everybody, how you doing? Um, all right, this is going to be a weird one. Well, a weird one in the following way. Um, as you know, we, we had a lot of questions in, in one of the classes, and that was great. There was a lot of dialogue, and it was all really relevant, and I loved it. Um, but it did mean that uh, I had to find ways of, of repackaging the content I was planning to deliver um, to you. And so this part that, I, that I'm going to do here, um, it's something I like to do every year, but in a way, it's more about hmm, that whole activism thing and encouraging you to be activists. And, and it really just sort of takes something from the textbook and, and I run with it in a, in a direction um, that is not part of the textbook and not part of the usual intro site class. So what I've decided is this video, the things I'm going to talk about in this video are not required. Um, I'm going to call this a completely optional lecture. Um, I, I know a bunch of you are just stopping right now. Stop, delete. <laughs> that's fine. Um, but you may want to watch it. I will touch on something that's in the chapters. Um, so you will get a little bit of, of content that way. Um, but when we ask questions, we won't. So if you're a TA watching this, don't ask any questions about this video. Okay, so we won't we won't take anything from this video and put it on the exam. Uh, anything that's related to it from the textbook, we, we would only ask you from the textbook. But I still want to talk to you about it for two reasons. First, I mean, I think it's important for you to know sort of who your professor are, professors are. And I think it's important that professors share with you um, a little bit of their passions and, and their views outside of the course. I think it's, it's important to see us as human beings. Um, and I think it's also important to, to, for us to model certain things that, that are important. Um, and what I'm going to be modeling today or what I'm going to be talking about is this notion of keeping your, your antenna up for issues that you're really passionate about, issues that could end up um, becoming a major part of your life. Uh, and, and I'm actually going to, you know, I'm filming this after my dong came into class from Swab the World. Um, and, you know, I talked before about how she is like a real role model of somebody who's found a passion in life. And, and in her case, you know, trying to get more non-Caucasian uh, stem cell donors uh, in the stem cell database. Um, if you go through life, as you go through life, there may come a time when you feel you need something else in your life, that you need a cause, you need your life to be about something. Um, you know, for many people, that might just be family. You know, I, I know a lot of people in my family circle who, who's, you know, I, I think of um, my, my wife's mother. She is the consummate grandmother. And for her, it's all about taking care of her family. And that's what she's passionate about. And she does it in an amazing, and amazing way. Um, at other times, it's causes that you take on. Um, and I want to encourage you to to keep an ear out for your causes. Keep thinking about if I were ever going to show sort of activist tendencies, if I were ever going to try to change the world, um, how would I change it? What would I change about it? And do I care enough about that to actually try to change it? Um, so let's talk about that. And we're talking about this in the context of ethics. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about this in the context of, of research ethics. And a lot of this, this is a classic sort of example of how sometimes some of the things that people have done in the name of research have been very questionable. So here's, here's a little story. So there's a guy named Edward Jenner. He observed, so there were milkmaids, by the way, were people who milked the cows. Um, and there was an outbreak, out, outbreak of smallpox at the time, and Edward Jenner observed that milkmaids did not get smallpox. And so he was trying to understand why. And there's an animal, a bovine version of smallpox called cowpox. And so his notion was that maybe these milkmaids, because they were, you know, interacting with cows so closely, maybe they were exposed to cowpox and maybe that somehow protected them from smallpox, you know, kind of like a vaccine idea. Um, and so 
everything's fine so far, except how did he test his theory, right? How did he test this notion? Well, he literally would inject cowpox uh, into children um, and later expose the children to smallpox, okay? So that's questionable, right? These children who otherwise might have been perfectly fine are now being exposed to two viruses um, intentionally. And so this is the kind of thing where, you know, even if the intention of Edward was fine, this seems to make people go, hang on, is there not a better way to do this than, than that way? Um, now, within psychology, this is sort of more of a medical um, example, but within psychology, if you looked into the research of Milgram on authority, or if you looked into the Stanford prison experiment, these were experiments done in the 70s where there was some questionable ethics there as well. And I'm not going to go into details other than to say these became very popular studies. People got to know about Milgram's studies and about the Stanford prison experiment, but they got popular because they had aspects that didn't seem like the right thing to be doing to people in research situations. Uh, and so after they came out and after the public got a little upset about it, um, that's when the American Psychological Association said, okay, you know what? We need to enforce some rules for research. And um, well, how do they enforce the rules? So first of all, they work in conjunction with granting agencies and virtually all research done on universities is supported by one of these granting agencies. And all of these granting agencies say, if you want to do research with our money, you must follow the APA rules. Okay, so what are the APA rules? They're described a little bit differently in the textbook, um, but it's, it's the same ideas as, as you'll get through here. And the important thing I want to highlight for you today is there's, there's two distinct sets of rules, one for humans and one for animals, okay? When it's humans, before you even do the research, you have to submit a full proposal to something called, here they call it an institutional review board. We call it a review ethics board, an REB. Um, but there's a board of people who are going to look at your proposal and they're going to weigh two things. They're going to weigh the benefits, like how could this research be beneficial? But they're also going to look at the risks, um, what risks are involved. And they're kind of going to consider those two things. Do the benefits justify the risks? But even with the risks, there's some rules that we just have to follow. And so let's just go through some of these. For example, coercion. We are not allowed to force anybody to participate in research. Um, you'll notice that in this course, you can get marks for participating in research. That's cool. Uh, but we even then give you an alternative. There is an alternative written assignment that you can do if you would rather do that and rather not participate in research because we cannot force you to participate. Okay, we can invite you. We can tell you it's a great learning experience and all those things are true. Um, but ultimately, if you say, nope, I don't want to do it, then we're not doing it, period. Um, related to that is informed consent. And we've talked about this in class a little bit. You cannot collect data from anybody until they know that's what you're doing, okay? You must, participants must know that they're involved in research and they must give their consent or permission to do so. Um, you cannot just collect data from people without their consent and publish it in, in journal articles or talk about it at conferences. You need to get consent. Uh, and typically when you're getting consent, you need the, the, the participant to know some of the important parts of the study. How long is this study? What am I going to be asked to do? And if there is anything that's ethically, mm, you know, pushing a line in any way, the the inform, uh, the participant should be informed about it. Like, uh, let me just, that sounded sort of more, dom uh, more mysterious than I meant it to. For example, let's say you're going to present swear words in a study because maybe you're interested in do they grab attention. Well, if you're going to do that, you may have to inform participants ahead of time. By the way, occasionally during the study, we're going to present swear words um, to you. And if, if that's a problem, then maybe you don't want to be part of the study. Okay, so something like that, we're supposed to um, let you know ahead of time so that you give informed consent, so that you understand, you know, what's being asked of you. Um, we have to treat your data 
well. Um, anonymity and confidentiality, okay? If we can strip your name from the data altogether, that's what we do as soon as we can so that your data is not connected to you personally. Um, but certainly to the extent we have to kind of keep any information about you connected to your data, it's kept, you know, locked and enc uh, encrypted and all, all that kind of stuff. We have to make sure we're protecting your privacy. Um, that's cool. Risk. And now this is the one the textbook talks about in various ways. They talk about it in terms of respect and other things, but basically participants cannot be placed at significant mental or physical risk. You do not harm the participant physically or psychologically. You have to treat them with respect. They are a human being. Okay. And then debriefing. At the end of the participation period, the researcher should be told what the study was about. Um, you should have ways of contacting the researcher if you want to ask questions after the study. And generally speaking, they should spend some time with you kind of going through what the research was all about, what they hope to find, etc. cetera. Um, and so that should happen right at the end. If it seems like they don't want to do that, ask them to do that. Say, hey, aren't you supposed to debrief me about the study? Professor Jordan says you were going to debrief me, and and then hopefully they will. Okay. Now there's this little caveat, and and we ran into this in class already uh, a little bit. Deception. You can deceive participants if it's really critical to you. Remember we were talking about things like uh, manipulating self-esteem by telling people they did well or poorly on a math test and lying to them. <laughs> Maybe they really didn't do bad, but you're telling them they did bad. Um, and so that sort of case, the, the experimenters say, well, we have to deceive them because we have to create these different conditions. And you're allowed to do that. Um, but you really have to be clear after as part of the debriefing, the experimenter has to say, you know, listen, this is, this is what was really going on. And I lied to you about that. And I'm sorry, but here's why I lied to you. It was critical to the study. And those are the sorts of things the research board make sure true. You know, is that deception critical to the study? Was there a different way to do it? If they think it was critical, then they will allow it. Okay. So. This is an interesting jumping off point because when you kind of think about this, you think, okay, that's sort of the worst that can happen to you. Someone might lie to you and then afterwards fess up and tell you why they lied. Okay. Let's talk about animal research. In order to do um, research on animals, you have to have a reason, right? There has to be a justification to do it. Um, you have to care for and house the animals in a humane way. So you have to make sure they've got the food they need, they've, they're housed in the right temperature, right dryness, etc. Sometimes a certain amount of attention is paid to them, etc. And so people will come and make sure the animals are being treated well. Uh, the, you have to acquire these animals legally. And look at number four, you must minimize suffering. Okay, this is where things get tricky with animal research because remember with humans, the worst you could really do was lie to a human. To an animal, you can do all sorts of things if you can justify it. Uh, so for example, we have already talked about so-called ablation studies where you basically perform surgery on the animal and remove parts of its brain to see what that part of the brain does you're obviously doing irreversible damage to the animal's brain when you do that. They would never allow you to do that to a human being, um, but they will allow you to do it to an animal because they think we're gaining some you know, really useful knowledge. I mean, I'll give you another example, which are studies on stress. Um, if you want to study stress in an animal, you have to stress the animal. You have to put it in situations where it's feeling stress. And if you're interested in studying long-term chronic stress, then you have to put that animal in a long-term chronically stressful situation. How do they do that? They do things like put animals in, in pools of water where there's no real place for them to stand. And so they just swim and swim and swim and they feel like they're going to drown at some point because there's no place where they can stop or rest. Um, and they feel stressed. Uh, and so some of these procedures, to me, feel extremely close to torture. I will say it. I will say the word torture. Um, and I, at some point, started questioning 
A very simple question. Why is it okay to do that to animals? There, there's an implication that there's a difference of some sort. That, that for some reason, it's okay to do things to animals that if we considered doing that to a human, we'd say, no, 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 you can't do that to a human. Why? What's the difference? Why do humans deserve a higher ethical standard? So first of all, let me say, there are different, you know, everybody, including all animal researchers, um, you know, it's not that they're evil people that are just enjoying causing pain and suffering. And in fact, you know, within that community, there's also a very serious effort to try to reduce the damage that's being caused. And so one of the approaches is called the three R's in, in animal testing. And the idea is, hey, if you could do the same research without using animals, this is the first R, replacement, then don't use the animal research method. So only use them when you have to. But if we can replace them with non-animal research, let's do that whenever we can. Um, reduction. So if you could get some finding um, reliable with four animals, don't do 40. Like don't, don't expose more animals to any of this than you need to, to make the science effective. Okay, so reduce the number of animals used when you can. And then refinement, uh, improve the experiments so that the animals, well, do not suffer. I think that sounds really nice, do not suffer, um, but really it's suffer less in, in many of these situations. How can you reduce the amount of pain and suffering that you're causing? So replace it when you can, reduce, it as, reduce the use of animals as much as possible and refine methods to try to minimize pain and suffering. All really nice. You know, and, and the three R's is an approach that many people believe in. I have found myself being what would be called more an abolitionist. Um, so abolitionists in the slave days were, th th this by the way, this three R approach is what we call a welfare approach. So we're really trying to ensure, we're gonna keep doing animal research, but we're really kind of try to optimize their welfare. The abolitionist approach is now just stop doing it. Stop doing it. And so the abolition of slavery was just stop having slaves. Like, no, there's no, there's no humane way to do this. We need to just stop. I, in the animal camp, I'm not really kind of stop, but I'm stop the double standards. I, I'm of the opinion that if it's unethical to do that to a human, then we shouldn't do it to an animal. Um, and yeah, that there should be one ethical code applied to all life forms. That's where I've kind of come in. It's after reading a lot of stuff and, and you know, I'm also vegetarian, as many of you know, I'm actually vegan wannabe. I believe veganism is the right way to be um, and I'm trying to get there. Um, cheese. I love cheese. <laughs> so I, I, otherwise, I've pretty much reduced my dairy almost to nothing. But I really feel like we need to much more respectfully interact with animals. And I think the scientific community has to lead that charge. This is for critical thought. This is something for you guys to think about. You know, when when we talk about racism, we're saying we think everybody, irrespective of their, their cultural or racial background, we should all get the same opportunities. We should all be treated relatively equally. There should not be systematic biases that, that you know, cause some groups to have to have harder time in life than others. Uh, and we, of course, know those biases exist, but we're all sort of aware and we want to reduce those, right? Um, and, and have a world that's equal for all. And this also, if we talk about sexism, you know, the same sort of notion that there's no reason why males should have more opportunities and more whatever than females. We, we would love a world where, where we treat people equally with full respect, irrespective of their cultural, racial background or gender. The interesting next step is what about other animals? You know, is it the case that we should be respecting them like we respect ourselves? And that doesn't mean necessarily giving them full slate of human rights, but it might mean, you know, 
not doing things to them that we would consider horrible if done to human beings. Is this just speciesism? Is, is the only justification for this the fact that we're humans and they're not? And if you're part of the club human, then you get a higher ethical standard applied to you. If you're not, sorry, um, then we feel free to do things to you that we would never do to a human. Is there a justification? Is it just about being human or not? Or is there a justification? So I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, and, you know, one of the things that bothers me about the, the scientific research approach is the so-called have your cake and eat it to approach. So what a lot of the people who do animal research um, suggest are both of these things. They try to hold both of these opinions at the same time. Animals are similar enough to humans that the research we do on human uh, on animals rather will be relevant to us. So let's say we're trying to cure diseases and so we give the animals cancer and then we try to we try to do cures on them. Our assumption there is if we find something that works on a rat, it will work for a human. Okay? And you'll see that's yeah, that's controversial. Um, but at the same time, they also want to say but but yes, animals are similar enough so that the research we do will apply to humans, but they're different enough that it's okay to do things to them that we wouldn't do to a human. So they're trying to say, you know, both of these things at once. And I'm like, hmm, that is, you want to have your cake and eat it too. You know, you want to say, yeah, similar enough, but different enough. And especially this last one, different enough how? What sort of difference makes somebody worthy of a higher ethical standard? This is just something about that first one, that animals are similar enough to us that what we find in animal research applies to humans. This is not a view that people who work in this area generally end up believing. Um, I don't usually like just sort of quotes to authority like this or, or reaching out to authority, but these are important people. And, and I think these perspectives are important. So former director of NIH, traditional animal testing is expensive, time consuming, uses a lot of animals, and from a scientific perspective, the results do not necessarily translate to humans. Um, okay, that's a nice way of saying it. Let's see the former director of, of NIH down here. We've moved away from studying human disease in humans. We all drank the Kool-Aid on that one, me included. The problem is that testing on animals hasn't worked and it's time we stop dancing around the problem. We need to refocus and adapt new methodologies for use in humans to understand disease biology in humans. And you see a number of other people sort of saying the same thing that animal research isn't even very effective. So that's the first one of the have the cake, right? That's the similar enough that, that we're gonna learn something and it doesn't even look like that's generally believed. And then you add the second one of, okay, so why are we justified to do this stuff? You know, even if it did help, we should still need a justification. What What is that justification? Wow, did I ever have dark hair there? Look at that. That's fascinating. That wasn't this long ago. But this was, a, this was an interesting um, me kind of repackaging something that a student said to me. And this was a class where I was talking about evolution theory a little bit. And this, this student was not a fan of evolution theory. And they raised their hand and they said outright to me, um, Sir, I have a perspective I'd like to present. Scientists love to say, you know, that evolution theory is, is right and, and they tell us all the time we should be believing in evolution theory. Evolution theory suggests that there is no qualitative difference between animals and humans, that we're all related and that we all evolved in these different branches. And that's why it's so offensive to many religions, um, because the notion is there is no difference between us and other animals. We are all animals of different Species, exactly. Um, and so he said, if scientists really believe that, then they wouldn't do things to animals that they would refuse to do to humans. They wouldn't have two ethical codes. The fact that they have two ethical codes suggests that scientists really believe that humans are special, that they're different in some way than animals, um, which is not what evolution theory says. And so this student was saying, they don't believe what they're telling us to believe. Now, I turn that on its head a little bit. 
I do believe evolution theory. I do believe we're all animals, but I believe that student was right that our behavior in a research context suggests that we don't really walk that walk. And if we need a respectful interaction with animals in order to get our world together, and I think we do in the, in the world of climate crisis and global warming, we have to start by saying we share this planet with other animals. We have to begin by treating them respectfully. Um, the scientific community should be where that starts. The scientific community should, should not be modeling to students this sort of notion that there is some important difference. Humans are better. We deserve a better ethical standard. And again, all stuff for you to think about uh, as you go through this. Uh, so my main point of all this is a couple of things. So one is, this is an important point for me, and I make these arguments whenever I can, even though it's uncomfortable. You can probably expect that a lot of my colleagues don't like me talking like this. Um, you are going to go into classes that will be led by animal researchers who will talk about animal research as though it's, of course, justified. Um, they will try to indoctrinate you. Now I say that and I don't mean it to sound manipulative. They've been indoctrinated themselves. Okay, Our university systems are ones that present animal research and the things that we do to animals as completely and utterly justified. They never talk about it directly. They just act like it's justified. And often they don't like when it's brought out into the open and, and students are challenged to think about this issue. But that's what I want to do with you. Um, so this says, do not indoctrinate your children. Teach them how to think for themselves, how to evaluate evidence, and how to disagree with you. I'm a big fan of this. I disagree with them. Where do you stand? Um, maybe you don't agree with me. Maybe you do agree with me after doing this. Maybe you've never really thought about where you stand. The important thing is I want you to think about it. I don't want you going through university just accepting that the way the world is, the way animal research is done, is good because everyone does it that way. I want you to think about it, and I want you to come up to a position yourself, not through indoctrination, through thought and consideration. Uh, and if that brings you to a place where you're comfortable with animal research, then that's perfectly fine. I'm not telling you to believe what I believe. I'm just asking you to, to think and come to a reason spot yourself. I also want to use this as an example for the point that I made at the very beginning of this. As you go through life, you may find causes that, that are important to you. This cause is important to me. And when I get a chance, I will speak about it. As, as I'm doing right now. Um, and I will try to get people to think a little differently about stuff. Uh, it is one of the things I'm very passionate about. The other one is enhancing education, trying to find ways of enhancing public education. Those are the two things I'm trying to use my life to do right now, other than, of course, everything else I do. Uh, and so I would encourage all of you guys to, again, keep that in mind as you go through life and, and, and pay attention to the things that are really important to you. And one day you may actually want to, to put your time and your efforts and your mouth and your skills behind some cause. And I really encourage you to do that. I think it brings something to your life that you'll feel missing without it. Okay, I'm just going to leave it there. Um, fantastic. I will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I was just about to press pause. And I wanted just to leave you with this because I, because I do think this is an important quote. If you don't like the way the world is, you change it. You have an obligation to change it. You just do it one step at a time. It's slow. It may seem like it can't happen, but I want you to all believe you have the power to change the world. And if there's things you don't like, consider changing it or at least doing your part. All right, now I'm really done. Bye-bye.